if we look at generations, their attitudes, perceptions, and beliefs coalesce into behaviors that impact our industry. And between the generations, you see some major shifts. Right now, we're going through a colossal shift with our millennials. So a shout out from the millennials. Who do we have in here who is a millennial? Just don't want to hear from you. Okay. <laughs> If you go to conferences, you can't get out of these conferences without a millennial segment. <clears throat> so being the marketing professional that Tracy described, you know, I had to do a little bit of armchair behavioral science. And, and so I'm a participant observer in my household. And I went to my oldest, Emily, who is a millennial, and I said, uh, millennial, uh, Emily, <clears throat> I'm doing this project, could you help me out? And she said, Dad, that's the problem with you Generation Xers. You're always trying to study the millennial brain. At which I replied, well, that's because I'm actually sort of befuddled by yours, uh, but would you be my focus group of one? At which point she said, uh, hashtag no dad, that would be weird. <laughs> So we had to go about our research in a more formal fashion, and I want to let you know that all my data points are from a national study, big sample, and they were all, it was all done by Data Essential, which is one of the foremost market research firms in food service today in America. We do love our millennials, but they aren't typical millennials. You differ from the average coffee drinker out there. So my talk is gonna focus on their uniqueness because if we can demystify the differences and we can decode their language, we can figure out how to best engage them. And engage them we must because there are 87 million of you out there and we need to win them for today and we need to own them through their lifetimes. Now one of the things that makes millennials really attractive is the fact that they love to drink their coffee away from home. So that's one in four occasions versus about one in six occasions for non-millennials. Just one of the wonderful features about millennials. And another one is they spread their coffee purchases around to a whole variety of venues. So just like you and me, millennials use quality, convenience, and price as key determining factors in where to purchase their coffee. But as we shall see, there are many more greater needs that millennials have that we can answer to obtain their loyalty. But first, let's get a little bit more understanding here. It might not surprise you that millennials are more likely to consider themselves foodies. Now, the older millennials are where the younger millennials are going. They have income and independence. Younger millennials are on the same trajectory. But with this income and in independence, they spend it a lot of times on food. So the sentiment goes something like this. I'm a foodie. I love to learn about food. When I go out to eat, I like to try different things. I watch food shows on the Food Network. I read food publications. I mean, this is a generation that is interested in elevated sensory experiences. And they have some knowledge about what that experience ought to look like. So I wonder if that crosses over to coffee. Well, of course it does. In fact, this generation is more engaged in coffee than previous. And it's probably not surprising to you, based on their attitudes about food, that millennials are more likely to consider themselves coffee experts. So the sentiment goes something like this. I'm a coffee expert. I take pride in knowing about different blends, different brews, different beans, and different origins. So this is not a group that's just in it for the quick caffeine buzz. They are interested in the total experience, and we have an opportunity to build that experience for them. Another difference with millennials, it's not just about hot brewed coffee. But we've got a cold coffee revolution going on out there today. And it's very interesting that with iced coffee and frozen coffee, 
they're actually growing 40% over the last five years. Big expansion of opportunity for the people in this room. So we've got new need states, new occasions, new day parts. I mean, we're drinking coffee throughout the day, and we have the millennials to thank for that. Without them, this wouldn't have been possible. That knowledge also carries over to different brewing and preparation methods. We were intrigued to learn that millennials have either heard of or they've tried all these different brewing and prep methods. So the industry has been teaching them and millennials have been listening and learning. But what is more astonishing is that the, the appeal for the, some of the newer methods is even higher. So this is what we call the mystique of marketing. The curiosity about different brew and prep methods is even greater than the awareness and trial. So this is a tremendous opportunity that we can capitalize on as an industry. Now, Tracy mentioned the ongoing research that we've been doing as a community. And in fact, she shared some ideas just a couple of years ago with you. And my research is sort of a continuation of that research. One of the things that we learned during Young Coffee Drinkers Phase 1 was that they neither think about coffee nor define coffee the way you and I do. So you take the term specialty coffee. When they say specialty coffee, millennials are referring to the drink as a whole. And the coffee itself is just one component of the build. Now, when they define specialty coffee, they use a language that denotes a deeply emotional connection to that coffee. As you can see here, special name, special additions, an indulgent treat, a lot of different facets. Coffee is not a commodity for them anymore. It's a total experience. So let's give some thought about how do we engage them. I like to consult the father of needs theory in our country. As a matter of fact, American psychologist Abraham Maslow, and he's the one who postulated this needs pyramid, which has been roundly embraced by marketers over the years. In fact, we're approaching seven decades of Maslow. And as you'll recall from Psychology 101, you got these basic needs at the very bottom of the chart. These are more physical in nature and extrinsic in nature. And in order to graduate, and move up the pyramid, we got to meet those basic needs first. So for marketers, that means create some base level of customer satisfaction. And then the, our consumers give us permission to move up the hierarchy. Not a lot of loyalty generated here, but it's a start. So our job is to create a connection. What we want to do is move up the pyramid to these more psychological or intrinsic needs. If we do that, we can fulfill the desires of our consumers. And now we got something. We've got an ongoing business concern. And then finally, for Maslow, we try to reach for the peak, these transcendental moments at the very top. You know those as self-actualization, right? This is a state of fulfillment that, while it might be transient, it is where the ultimate experience occurs. Highly emotional in nature, what we're trying to do at this phase is to create evangelists. So this is net promoter score off the charts. And these are people who go out and tell the story of our brand and of our coffee. So that's the construct we used in our research to really think about the needs of the millennials. And here you go. At the basic level, they're kind of like you and they're kind of like me. They were looking for things like cleanliness, freshness, consistency, and affordability. Now these are table stakes. These are the basic non-negotiable requirements that every food service establishment has to have as the cost of entry just to get into the business with millennials on coffee. Then as we move up to the next level, we start to dial up the experience, right? So things like variety of flavors, breadth of selection, seasonal offerings, and even the atmosphere. So we're building out this total experience and we're moving into the realm of the psychological. And then finally, we want to reach for the peak. Remember, that was that area of fulfillment that Maslow talked about. 
And for the millennials, what we learned is they're looking for higher order needs, much more emotional in nature. So things like brand image, trendiness, and even environmental and social responsibility. And that's where we really have spent the second phase of our research that was conducted in 2015. We wanted to try to pry into some of the needs that we're hearing to unpack their meaning and understand their significance so we could use those as leverage in building our programs to address the millennials. One of the things we learned was that customization is no longer an option, okay? Customization might have been heretofore thought of as kind of an enhanced need, second tier, no more. It's right there with freshness and affordability. Now millennials don't dictate the way we address this customization, but the customization or the potential for customization has to be there in order to gain access to millennials. And of course the epitome of customization is the barista. Baristas make my coffee my way when I want it. And just the mere presence of a barista catapults an establishment in the perception of quality. It also lends credence to the notion that the place is upscale. And finally, for some millennials, to be truly handcrafted, you almost have to have a barista. But millennials are not requiring baristas and they're not requiring the coffee to be truly handcrafted. Remember, they buy from multiple sources. We learned that at the beginning of my talk. So there are a lot of ways to keep building out this experience. One of the ways is to tap into their vocabulary. What are the words that they use to describe their needs? And it's important that we don't just kind of throw out empty marketing terms. These will ring hollow and millennials, remember, are savvy and knowledgeable and they'll see through that. So when we use a term, let's make sure that we know what it means. For instance, if we want to make a claim on freshness, know that fresh brewed for millennials means brewed within the last 30 minutes. Similarly, fresh ground means ground that day. Now these terms are pretty straightforward and there's broad consensus on them, but there are other terms at the very top of that pyramid that are a little more ambiguous. You take, for instance, sustainability. It's a sort of a broad familiarity, widespread, but very little actual understanding. So what does that mean for us as an industry that gives us the opportunity to define it? And why would we want to define it? Because if we can get congruent with the values of our millennial friends and we can use their words, we can figure out how to captivate them and use sustainability in the proper way so that all of us in the industry benefit. Now, we really pried into the sustainability term because this was paramount to the second phase of research. And we were surprised at its breadth and depth. I mean, the impact with sustainability is far beyond what we even considered. For instance, for millennials, just having sustainable coffee, it helps millennials feel better about what they drink. And it creates this tremendous gravitational pull upward on a lot of those basic factors, things like freshness, better flavor, healthy. These are things that are at the base level. Sustainable actually validates them if you have a sustainable coffee program. This is what we call the sustainability halo. There are tremendous positive externalities about sustainability that we discovered in the research. An example is if you have sustainable coffee, millennials give you credit as a place. They just think more positively about your total establishment. And millennials would pay more for sustainable coffee. As a matter of fact, in our research, about 50 cents more on a per serving basis, which impressed us. We think we have some evidence now of what some may call the holy grail of sustainable coffee, proof that millennials at least are willing to pay more to know that the impact of their coffee on the journey to their cup was both environmentally and socially responsible. Good news for all of us in this room. So how exactly do they define sustainability? Well, more in terms of environmentally or eco-friendly, okay? Also green, not harmful to the environment. Now this contrasts a little bit with the concept of ethically sourced, which pertains more to farms and, and labor. 
millennials voted the term sustainably sourced over ethically sourced on a two-to-one basis in our study. And at the very top of the list of motivators that would cause them to select one venue over another, they were all green factors, as you can see here. Now, ethically sourced is still there. It's important and it's supportive, but it was these green factors that really meant more to the millennials. So we decided to test this notion and some of what we were learning about sustainability with a couple of programs that are out there to get the feedback from millennials on what's working, what's not, and why is it working. So we looked at two. One on the left-hand side is Chick-fil-A's recently launched in August of 2014, Thrive Farmer Sustainable Coffee Program. So a little more farmer focused. And then on the right is a Starbucks program known as Cafe Practices. And of course, it's been out there for quite some time. It's more environmentally focused. While the awareness for both programs isn't necessarily impressive, the appeal and the impact on positive opinion was really, really high for both. Now, Starbucks scores were just a little bit better. Maybe that's because their program is tilted towards the environment. But it's astonishing how far Chick-fil-A has come as a QSR in only a little over 18 months. And you can imagine how important that was to them at the beginning of a program when they're trying to generate awareness and trial and the re relaunch of their coffee, that they could enjoy that halo of sustainability to generate a positive pull on quality and freshness and get people to, to try their coffee at the beginning stages of a new coffee program. So what did they get right? They just didn't slap sustainability on the menu and throw around an empty term. Their program is really more of a platform. I mean, they, they talk about it online. They've got a dedicated URL called Coffee with a Story. They have farmer profiles on their cup. They have posters in the store. This is an end-to-end -end comprehensive program that really has teeth. So where does that leave us? At the end of the day, millennials want a story. But they want you to tell them your story authentically in your brand voice. So if you don't have baristas or you, don't have, you can't handcraft, no problem. Yeah, don't fake it. Be cautious about your marketing terms and your claims. Make sure that there are true reasons to believe. So what do you talk about? Tell them about your coffee, where it came from, Tell them about what you're doing in the supply chain. What are you doing to be green? And most of all, speak to them honestly and authentically. Once you nail down your program and you start to get the foundation built on those basic needs, reach higher. Move up to enhanced needs and even elevated needs. Seek the peak and absolutely have a sustainability component to your program. We want to strive for 100% sustainability for all our coffee roasters and all our coffee retailers. You'll be glad that you did. You'll be able to win the millennial for today and enjoy serving them for life. Thank you.